live stream. Ladies and gentlemen, David Dubine, missing in action, is live on the show tonight. It's a pleasure to have him on, the creator of Adapt 2030 and many Ice Age conversations, as well as dozens of other audio and podcasts around the blogosphere. Welcome to the show, David. I know you're exhausted from the permaculture orchard. How the heck are you? Yeah, exciting and uh, lost in action, missing in the Amazon, whatever you were talking about there. I just took a break to uh, plan out my orchard during the proper time. You know, the moon was coming full because I like to garden with the moon. And then the same time we were coming into the planting season and then I had my bare root trees. So I was just trying to put priority to getting those in the ground at the right time last month compared to trying to put out content because I can put out content anytime, but I can't have the proper time of the moon phase and the proper season going in with the right intent at this beginning of the year to put an orchard in. It's like once in a year thing, but then just this month or last month in the beginning of the, it was a perfect time. So to get the synchronicities of moon phase timing and season timing coming into uh, March, you know, it's it just a really good time. Everything just kind of synced in that to get it in the ground. So I hired a, a manager to come up, an orchard manager who had years of experience putting orchards in for others. And uh, I learned so much by doing that. Really learned a lot. So missing in action for some is like giant leaps forward for self-sufficiency for others. So we're talking about the pink super moon boom, which is happening in just a few hours here. Uh, tens of hours and it's called the pink super moon pink not because the moon's actually pink but pink because of the creeping flocks that's associated with this particular super moon were you aware of that mr dubine no i wasn't i didn't even know there was a super moon this month i uh was looking at the meteor shower yesterday and the day before on the 21st but uh 22nd but I didn't know anything about the super moon because, uh, you know, I was more concerned about the moon getting out of the way so I could see some of the, the meteor shower at 4 a.m., you know, freezing my butt off here, 20, you know, 28 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, 30 degrees below normal temperatures. We were expecting to throw a picnic blanket out, start a campfire, watch the meteor shower, no mosquitoes, perfect time of the year. And then it turned out to be with too cold to go outside because it was that that so far below normal it should have been in the 50s in the evening mid 50s but it was you know mid 20s instead so meteor shower got put off it was epically clear skies moon was in the way a little bit but it was just so incredibly cold it's like being in the middle of winter going outside to watch the meteor shower well let's uh let's talk about the super moon and why it's so important during any moon phase to plant the, the consensus is that you plant things that require moisture to sprout, like seeds, as the, the moon is waxing towards full. And the same reason that a supermoon waxing towards full creates these extreme spring tides or neap tides is because of the uh, tidal effect on the, that uh, planetary body uh, moving around us at its closest position at its uh, perigee, in fact, on our planet. And so it, what it does is in the subsurface is it brings the groundwater up and it actually keeps the seeds moist, helping them germinate. Same thing with bare root trees. So you were getting those bare root trees in during the waxing phase of the full moon so that the, the uh, young roots could get maximum moisture and maximum effect. Now you were telling me a little bit about how productive your uh, orchard looks, even though you had quite a, a colossal 27 degree day the other day. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's all about what you want to put in the hole after you dig the hole to put your plant in. Like Joel, Joel Salatin, if you ever watch any uh, sustainability off Polyface Farm from Joel Salatin's designs, he's always like, and his grandfather, this guy's already in his mid-70s, but his grandfather telling him, you know, don't dig a hole and put a $10 plant in a $1 hole. Meaning, you know, after you dig it, you just throw the plant in and that's it and you expect it to grow. Because I don't know how many people come at me with comments and Diamond, you know, you'll probably get the same because you, you understand permaculture and whatnot. 
They're like, dude, it's not that difficult. All you have to do is put the seed in the ground. Or, oh, dude, it's not that difficult. All you have to do is plant the plant. I'm like, wait a second. No, no, no. It really is way difficult. Because we took the time to inoculate every hole after soil testing. So we soil tested the areas where we were going to put each individual type of plant. So you got the cherry trees over here and about 6.0. And then the plum trees were right around six, but then the wine vines were right around seven. And we had uh, peach, different varieties of peach, and then the apple trees like really rocky soil. So we we're trying to find hillside well drainage, got the persimmon trees, and then we had the pears. So we we're kind of looking around to see what each one likes for nitrogen or lack of nitrogen as well. So, you know, putting in the holes, you know, I bought the, uh, the kelp, the organic kelp, bought 100 pounds of that. Got the uh, fish meal for certain things in the alfalfa meal, you know, because plums and uh, peaches like a little more nitrogen. So putting out that kind of thing in the hole. Mycorrhizae for every single hole and uh, bone meal, you know, but it was about trying to get the proper nutrients and mix in that. So when the roots got in there, that they took off to like max maximum root production the first year. So then next year, I'm going to get maximum first year fruit production because I chose dwarf varieties for everything. A, for spacing so we can put more out on the land, but B, because they're going to start bearing fruit next year. And a lot of them were hybrid species. And I even got something called a plum cot, which is a mix between a plum and an apricot. And that was the very first one that bore leaf during this spring season. So for me, I'm thinking about, you know, like you are, Diamond, when we come in as grand solar minimum, Food production in the most efficient, fastest manner is going to be the one that wins. So me thinking out, not like a regular orchard person who wants to, you know, get a 30, 40 year orchard out and get the proper type of trees. I want the same longevity, but I want the fruit bearing next year because I want to start making jams, alcohols. Because, you know, you got to think about alcohol. I'll talk about that in a minute. But, you know, my whole point of doing the fruit was for tradability and medicine and alcohol out of my whole plantation. So I got five, six different types of fruit, and each one of those is targeted for a different medicinal purpose as well as the alcohol and the tradeability. And they call uh, – the last point, the way my orchard manager set it up when we were ordering the plants because I have a registered farm was what's called continuous fruit drop. So the types of trees and the varieties of trees, we didn't get just all one kind of apple. We got you know three different kind of apple trees, and we didn't get just one type of plum got three different types of plum trees and apricots and uh the you know so the cherries they're going to ripen at different times during the year some are going to be early ripening bearing fruit in the beginning middle of the year and then others are going to be at the end toward the fall so we should have fruit for at least six to eight months continuously and that's that whole you know continuous fruit drop and then there'll even be some late bearing that should hold the fruit until december so I'm thinking about longevity and continuous year-round fruit production where others might not have that because you know the value of having fruit for tradability because there's so many. There's so many. Uses for that, for the fruit. I mean, there's a million billion uses. If you've got fruit, you have something very special versus having a vegetable. Now, Way I wanna, different. let me chime in here. Do you, are you aware of the work of Stefan Subkoyak? Now, he comes from... I am uh, not. Never even heard the name. Enlighten, okay. Well, enlighten me, Diamond. Enlighten me. I implore all of you to look at the, the work of Stefan Subkoyak. He comes from uh, Fermi Farms in Ontario, I believe. Don't quote me on it. It could be uh, somewhere else, but he's definitely up in Canada. Now, he's developed the nitrogen apple pear or the NAP method of permaculture orchard uh, design, and it has become uh, what the standard of design in orchard. So you've done your homework over there. You've got your orchard manager. You're putting in the right biodiversity of trees uh, so that you have fruit production at different times of the year. That's, that's amazing. The next thing you have to think about, what you should be thinking about this spring and this summer, which could be the summer of bummer with the whole uh, woo flu and all that nonsense, is thinking about the understory and also planting in between your trees because the nitrogen apple pear or the nap method works on a specific methodology of planting nitrogen apple pear. It could be apple pear plum, apple plum peach, apple plum cherry. But what you're doing is you're changing the fruit types. You're never putting apple, 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 plum, plum, plum. And this prevents the buildup 
of dangerous insects or other uh, pathogens that might blight your orchard. So by making a biodiverse orchard by alternating the trees, nitrogen, apple, plum, and if you don't have any nitrogen fixing trees, which are like honey locust or carrageena bush or some other pea related tree, you could plant those in between your fruit trees and you'll actually be fertilizing them in the subsurface as time goes on. You won't need to add additional fertilizer. On top of that, you drop down from the mid substory to the lower substory and you can grow annuals, which retain moisture and keep the sun away from the base of your uh, fruit trees. And that would be uh, annuals and perennials like uh, fruits and vegetables, especially medicinal herbs like mints, thyme, oregano, and a, a lot of other fruit producing berries and bushes underneath the understory there in between the fruit trees like currants. Uh, gooseberry, raspberry, blackberry, and other things like that. And, and by creating this biodiverse orchard that you plant specifically, you will encourage all of the necessary uh, biome to actually fight pests. So what you'll bring in is using the biodiversity of plants, you're going to be bringing in insects that will actually help fight pests on your fruit trees and it's this biodiverse activity in these nap orchards nitrogen apple pear that have proved long-term success as far as uh harvests and and lack of use of alternative chemicals and the one thing we don't use here is any chemicals whatsoever so what you need is uh I forget what they call it. It's, it's an integrative pest management strategy and it has an acronym. I integrative pest, IP, eh, whatever it's called. The integrative pest management strategy has nothing to do with spraying chemicals, David. Can you believe it? It has everything to do with biodiversity and the plants that you plant underneath of your fruit trees. What say you? I say I want to bring in the wasps because they kill the caterpillars. And, you know, I did break my orchard into not just one solid orchard, but broke it in the middle and left wild field in the middle. So those kind of pollinators coming in, um, the different types of, uh, you know, different meat eating insects will be happy to come in and patrol my fruit trees. And the same, you know, you mentioned the apple trees here and also, the way we had to put the apple trees in the back part of the orchard, back behind the house on the on the field property that's going uphill, because we have cedar trees in the front, and there's a, a something called cedar rust, which if you plant your apple trees too close to the cedar trees, it's going to jump. It's an, an invasive. It kind of almost looks like a, I don't know, some kind of spongy, weird space alien apple type of a puffball, you know, mushroom that you've seen before. But it grows on the stems of the cedar tree, and we do have it out there. That's why I was very familiar with what it looks like. It's a brown. It almost looks like a, a brown kind of dimpled apple, and it grows on the cedar trees. That will easily and very quickly infect your apple trees to the point where it will kill them and it will take it over. So thinking about the cross uh, you know, species, the cross pest just in this, the tree species itself – but yeah, taking into consideration, we were thinking about, um, you know, sweet potatoes and the under canopy there and a whole bunch of different from comfrey was another one that was uh, ch chickpeas, cow peas and a whole bunch of different things to put inside and run those rows because all that extra space that's under there is going to be wasted if you don't utilize it. And then the first year is growing now. We have an enormous amount of sunlight because there's no over canopy. So anything in between the rows can get that full first year sunlight, like almost an open garden planning into the future if it's going to be uh, a perennial you know where you want to set it there in in terms of getting the light so th we, we already ended the the orchard so it would get the east west light it's a south facing area but as the sun transits the sky if there were full tree canopy at the end of the day the light would still make it through and uh, as the western setting sun would still come in on the sides of that and penetrate the tree layers and still give a little bit. So we put the wine vines to the far west out there. And uh, this integrated approach, which you're talking about, you know, I don't believe in using the pesticides either because I'm thinking grand solar minimum supply chain breakdown, we're not gonna have them. So you're gonna kind of be on your own without having to rely on a supply chain. So what did our grandparents, great grandparents do? And we have the benefit now of all this knowledge and, and you know, systems 
and people that have done so much research that can now share it with us at a moment's notice. You know, I'm starting to buy a lot of sulfur powder, a powderized sulfur, the chemical, the, the new, uh, we shouldn't even, chemicals are probably the wrong word to use, but just the element sulfur powderized to put on the trees instead of having to use a pesticide because I don't want to use pesticides. I need to eat that. And then it's going to continue to bioaccumulate in the soils. And I don't know what that's going to do to other plants that are going to uptake it. Because if systems are breaking down, and Diamond, you and I know both, man, economy's breaking down, supply chains are breaking down, and you, you're you going to have to start making your own way forward with natural remedies for not only your body, but for your plants and your garden, your trees, and the food we consume. Because no petrochemicals means you know yields are going to decline significantly, but if you're already in that mind frame of never using chemicals or limiting it to, I don't know, uh, you know, wasp, uh, so, yellow jacket nests and occasional spray in there with some uh kind of bee removal chemical or something other than that i don't want anything on my plants no you know, well what, yellow jackets are a nasty i've been stuck <laughs> up a few times man they're pretty heavy here and you get you get into a you know you get into a nest of yellow jackets and uh that that's a life-changing uh event you know and and fire ants too <laughs> like you guys don't have that in colorado but you are get you, into a nest are of you, fire ants here are you kidding you me always remember that you have to be kidding me, Mr. Dubine. Fire ants the number one mammal in our on our in our state. They live every three <laughs> three feet. Yeah, so we have plenty of fire <laughs> ants here. What I'm showing on the screen currently is a, an apple covered in cedar rust, and it's completely well, it's alien. It's not edible. It's over, Johnny. So I can see where your concern is there. Yeah, and it'll. Go ahead. It'll kill your plant. It'll kill your, kill your tree, too. It's not just about the inedibility of the fruit. It'll just kill your tree down to zero. So what's the distance you need to be from cedar trees to plant your apples? Uh, at least 600 feet, maybe more. It depends on – because the prevailing wind patterns here are, are directly east-west up and down the valley. So we separated those things by, you know – a uh, thousand feet or so. I didn't want it anywhere. And it's totally surrounded in the backfield by just, you know, forest, no pine tree. I even cut down all the, the, the Southeastern pine. We, I try to cut every pine tree out of there. So it's just deciduous forest separated by a huge line of trees, separated by a house, separated by a field <coughs> of a couple acres. And then the, the cedars are way down at the bottom of the bottom of the property. Now you're talking about uh, grand solar minimum preparedness, and I uh, I concur with all your warnings about the grand solar minimum and the inception of it. But my biggest worry is the magnetic reversal that is happening at the same time, and I believe it's my firm opinion that the magnetic reversal is more severe than the grand solar minimum could ever be, and the reason is that as we enter cycle 25. We are entering a position and we have a CME coming our way in just 30 hours that's going to give us a little uh, tippy touch on what's going to be happening in the next cycle. So we're going to get to know in the next three days what could be the potential. Uh, but my biggest worry is, and I shared tonight, a paper coming out in the last two hours or two days, I'm sorry, shows that a humongous flare uh, came off of Proxima Centauri. And the study was, I saw that one. Yeah, it was back in 2019. And the flare happened in May, mid-May of 2019. It only lasted for seven seconds. But it would be equivalent to an X100 or 300 here on Earth from our own sun. And if all of the thoughts of a galactic current sheet mimicking the solar current sheet, and this wave is now coming into our solar system... Um, Proxima Centauri is only 4.234 light years away, which means that in the summer of 2023, if that's the galactic wave hitting that star causing the flare, our star is going to flare in a similar way in August of 2023. And it's been my supposition for four years, and I've been warning that the summer of 2022 or 23 will be the grid down scenario. And based on this scientific analysis from this paper, if we just time it, because Proxima Centauri is 4.234 light years away, and we subtract that time, 
then this wave or the when the flare hit there will hit us 4.23 light years later will be in August of 2023. Now, if, if the grid goes down then in a big way, that's the end game. So you need to be ready by August of 2023 or it's game over. There's going to be no more, uh, you know, nurseries to buy trees. There's going to be no more online or any of that nonsense. So it's crunch time because that's two years away. What say you? I would say that's the reason all the containers are disappearing off the planet. Uh, you know, you joined on the vid tonight. I've gotten a little bit of uh, solid information from a couple of people I trust that are more, you know, much more high level at the C level of a lot of things operating on the corporate side of, let's say, deliveries on our planet here. And the containers that are disappearing, and you keep hearing about these container shortages, these shipping container shortages here, there, and everywhere. The excuse given right now was the Suez Canal is backing up a lot of, let's say, uh, you know, in inbound or outbound cargo. But it seems really that's the story that's out in front on the public. But what's happening behind is these containers are being packed full and shipped elsewhere in perpetuity or as a long-term storable box of whatever is inside there sent to wherever the, it would be. And I, I had a range of, you know, different locations for continuity of government sites to underground, to military, to, you know, there's a, there's a few other things. Like, believe it or not, corporations have their own continuity of corporation uh, stronghold areas. So like Exxon, for example, they, they're an entity unto them, their own, that has their own continuity of, it's not even continuity of government, it's continuity of corporation uh, super sites. So a lot of these things are being diverted over there. And when I say that, I really mean they're packing the containers full of whatever it is. Maybe it's storable foods inside there itself. Maybe it's repair, maintenance, repair, operation equipment to make new and tool new whatever equipment would be needed. Those containers are being filled to the brim, locked up and just sent off over there and they're being tucked in the corner. So when you hear about all these containers disappearing off the planet right now, this is what's happening. It's not that there's a bottleneck in shipping where there's a long turnaround time where somehow it got two weeks longer before it hits the port again. These containers are being filled up and then put where they're gonna be for continuity of continuation of our society. And it began three to four weeks ago. The Suez Canal, and again, that the Suez Canal was so bizarre for me, if I could rant for a second, Diamond, because I saw the Suez Canal and I go, oh, that's going to be a big thing, global shipping. I was looking for the excuse to collapse the global economy. So I was on that like a duck on a June bug right from the beginning. And I watched so many different uh, marine specialists and marine engineers, because for me, I, you know, I know buoyancy but marine engineers can explain the lexicon a lot better. So I really delved in. I watched 30 some plus interviews of all these marine engineers explaining that this thing was damn stuck in the mud and it's not coming out. And they're going to have to remove uh, the fuel oils, uh, the ship oils, the motor fuels or the, the bunker fuels and the ballast water before they can even begin to think about how they're going to get this thing floating again. And magically, they got that thing unlodged within uh, hours or week or days after they're like, this thing's stuck for months. And I'm like, the only way they could possibly do that was with anti-gravitics technology. That's the only possible way because once it was stuck on the mud, the buoyancy factors, it, it became a heavyweight object versus a buoyant object. So looking at the, the marine engineers explaining that all, all 30 of them that I, I'm going to say, just round it off to 30, hundred percent all agree that this thing is stuck until they unload it. And within days, they suddenly refloated it, which made no sense to me. So I'm thinking, all right, well, that was the narrative. And there's new technologies that we're not aware of that were able to make something more weightless to remove it off of defying science as we know it. But now getting this new information, I, it makes total sense. They had to have an excuse why the containers are getting thin on the planet. Well, when you look at it, like they're starting to pack the containers now and stick them away for long term, whatever continuity of government for example they're all being utilized now for the storage device that they really are 
and they're all being taken offline to pack, store, and get off for the next phase of what's happening, and it's in play now. And that was the change in the last 30 days. Your magnetic reversal for me is my 2024 October date. So we're like less than a year off of that second magnetic field forming out there, creating an enormous amount of electromagnetic activity and magnetic excursions and all kind of crazy things that are off the canyon walls of Chaco Canyon coming to life in our skies. But we're like less than a year off on our times coming at it from two different angles. And that's really interesting. I'm done ranting. Okay, great. I, I agree with you. So it doesn't matter where we're coming from. We're coming from the same place. The same things in the ancient skies will be coming true. It, it could be based on uh, the galactic current sheet and the fact that Proxima Centauri just flared. It could be due to uh, the alignment of the gas giants in our own solar system that you talk about. And when is that date, Dubine? Well, we're going to be passing, our Earth should be passing over the first magnetic final phase of uh, like encapsulation here coming up in July and August of this year. So if I'm anywhere close, and you are as well, we should see a massive, unbelievable uptick in volcanic activity, landslides, uh, earth cracks, and earthquakes coming up in July and August something so far above where we might get, you know, six, eight, nine, eight point oh earthquakes in a matter of a month as we transit through this next magnetic uh, coupling line here, because what this is it. Once the earth goes past this in July and it starts to get in the grip of those gas giants, we're in that magnetic field that they're forming for the duration until it forms to the strongest point. Like we never come out of that field until it's done and this event ends in October of 2024. Once we're in it, we're in it until it, it finishes its entirety. And you know that cross into that second magnetic field begins in July and August of this year. And then from, from each year forward, it's gonna get more intense and more intense. And you're talking about an arrival of a CME off another star Provided it's traveling at the speed of light. And there's a lot of CMEs that have reached our planet in eight minutes from the sun. So it's not outside the scope that that CME is traveling at the speed of light. And if all these things are coupling on top of each other and we've got two magnetic fields looping in on a Taurus wave. Because I, I want to go back to the Sumerians for a second. Because they, they counted from the outer planets inward. So you got, you know, Pluto, Uranus. And then you come on down in and you keep coming in. You got Neptune and then you got Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and then Earth. So if those four gas giants are looping in on a toroid field, the Earth's going to be two planets away from that new magnetic field. Slight as it may be, but then the Earth being the third planet away from the sun. And you know that you know as well as I do, that magnetic field is going to distribute between those two magnetic fields to some sort of equilibrium. One's not going to override the other. They're going to equalize if the, the best to their ability of the carrying charge off that new magnetic field forming. The sun's going to try to dissipate an equal charge in our solar system. That's what magnetics does. So we're going to get that torrid loop, two of them, and we're going to be right in the center of that. So coming up, governments know this. Our planet, our atmosphere is going to go absolutely berserk. And what you talk about, I'd like to know a little bit more about this. Uh, you know, magnetic excursion and what you feel the earth changes are going to be on this magnetic excursion. Because I have my own uh, ideas of how these jet streams are going to just fall apart completely too, that we might not even have jet streams. It'll be just a, a wispy bit of clouds moving around with no pattern to it. So I'm curious what you think on the magnetic uh, reversal or magnetic anomaly and how do you think our atmosphere is going to behave? Because that's what it's all about atmosphere changing because we saw pluto's atmosphere collapse neptune's atmosphere reversed and then the x-ray flares coming off of uranus the jupiter has a 10x increase in flares coming off of it both poles and if you look at it in the telescope jupiter looks blue now and there's a lot of atmospheric changes so diamond i'm asking you man what do you think is going to happen with this magnetic anomaly and magnetic excursion to our atmosphere as we move into 23 and 24 well i i I wholeheartedly don't think it matters if the breakdown of the jet stream occurs and our uh, weather patterns end or whatever. I don't think that matters. What matters is that the modern technology and our modern culture is going to end abruptly during a solar flare, which will 
bring down the grid. This is going to kill off huge portions of the population and cause the entire earth to smell like dead bodies. So very few people are going to worry about farming at that point. Those that know how to farm are going to continue to farm and we're going to do it in the way we can best do it. But the whole purpose is that of, of what I just said is the humongous flare from Proxima Centauri has nothing to do with the speed of light initially. The speed of light is the speed in which the galactic current sheet is coming at us, which causes the magnetic reversal. It's, it's not the speed of the solar flare from Proxima Centauri because that's not fast. It's not the, as fast as the speed of light. The flare that just came off of our own sun that's going to hit us in just a day or a day and a half on the 25th uh, left the sun two days ago. So it's not going to hit us for over 36 hours. Clearly that coronal mass ejection is traveling way less than the speed of light or else it would have been here in seven minutes. <clears throat> so I'm not worried about the speed of light and coronal mass ejections. It's the galactic current sheet. This is an invisible wave that's about to hit our planet, which causes these perturbations every 12,500 years, every 26,000 years, ongoing forever in the geologic record. And it changes the depositional regimes on our Earth. It doesn't shift the poles. It doesn't move masses. It doesn't cause any of this Adam and Eve story nonsense that other people are talking about. Based on the geologic record, that happens every 100,000 years. And that event is already past us. So this current event is going to be less egregious, less abrupt, but it's going to still end the empire due to a, co a, a, a cosmic wave that will cause a CME from our sun that will end the grid. When the grid ends, modern humanity is over, period. I don't care what, no one will, will be able to monitor the weather systems at that point, so it's, it's unimportant. What's important is that we know how to survive and thrive in the future. We know how to grow food under any and all circumstances. We know how to wild harvest and we know how to hunt. Well, we know how to survive and thrive and provide for our people. These are the important things. The science is irrelevant. And, and, and we're not going to die from a solar flare, but we're going to die from the end of the empire model and end of technology because 90 plus percent of the population rely on technology and that's how they're alive. It, which is completely crazy because if we just went back 150 years, 90% of the population didn't rely on technology and they knew how to survive. So what we've done in the last 100 years is we've created an environment where a huge amount of the population on our planet will die because they are unaware on how to survive. Final words, David. So you're saying the disappearing star field is part of this current sheath shutting down, well, not shutting down the stars, but causing them to flare off, dissipate, and then what we're seeing is what is considered dark space out there in unison marching toward us will be here in three years or less. That, that is a potential, yes. I'm not saying it will be, but I would say based on the speed, because Bar Barnard star... Uh, further out flared years before Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri then flared. We're the next star in from the center of the galaxy. And if this hypothesis holds true, which everything has shown is true, then we will flare in July or August of 2023. And, and what that means is that's like an X 20 or 30. And if it's earth facing, even if it's not, I'm sure there'll be a halo event it is going to break down the grid and people will suffer. So preparedness is everything. Yeah, wildcrafting skills would be the way to go. I, you know, I missed a little bit of the spring season emergence. I should have hired an expert to come out and walk me around my property and you know, took up images of every single thing that was edible. As we go through the seasons, that's one of my goals is every single season coming out to 
have somebody come out and teach me each season where the edibles are that I could walk through my land and find naturally growing wild edibles without me having to uh, rely on a grocery store. Because, you know, here, in, at least in East Tennessee, that's what the story is where the old timers are always waiting for the first emergence of these supple greens that would come out. And it was such the special period where the two weeks between the end of winter and the beginning of spring, it was like the most luscious greens that you've ever seen growing everywhere. And after those two weeks or so, whoosh, it just everything changed instantly again. But there was this magic two weeks of type plant species I hadn't ever seen before around here that all looked really edible. They all look like lettuces. I can't describe it to you, but it was, a, it was a two week event out of the entire year. And I missed that having an expert to show me during those two weeks of, I tell you, Diamond, it was the most luscious, vibrant, energetic, new earth vegetation that I've ever seen. Uh, and it was so fast, the onset, and it was so fast, the 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 finishing of it as well it was like a two week maximum period and the old timers talked about taking advantage of that two weeks to be able to find those nutrients that they were lacking from their diet during the long winter and they would rely on that two week super bloom period to grab the first greens of the year and then save those and cook them into soups and get all their nutrients back micronutrients by wild foraging so you know there's uh, that that that's going to be the only way i think to move forward is wild foraging in addition to what you're able to grow and then can and save on your own. And you know, we're using wood again. If you don't, your LPG is going to run out, your gas canisters are eventually run out. The thing you're going to be left with is wood. So how, how good are you at heating and cooking and doing things with wood, wood embers, charcoal, that kind of thing. I mean, that's a skill in itself. Yeah. Well, we do have biochar and other, these other technologies that we can really look into. And that's qu quite important moving forward. But the most important thing moving forward is understanding your biome. And you were talking about these spring emergence, which I'm well aware of on the East Coast. That's where I grew up my entire life, 40 years of my life. But uh, w you have to look out for the oxalic biologic uh, decimators and this is the skunk cabbage and other things look highly edible in the spring in your region and they're the most deadliest plants on earth uh, but what we we also have is the uh, spring fiddles from ferns which are delicious in the eastern forests and many other wild edibles that need to be uh, sustainably harvested you can't just harvest them all you can only harvest a small percentage or else you're going to lose uh, sustainability in those crops. So it's important to know how to wild harvest your edibles wherever you are, specifically for the fact that there are many extremely deadly and dangerous plants that look delicious in the spring when you're starving. Uh, the, the times we're coming into are times when you have to be uh, self-sufficient, self-reliant, uh, have food security, but you also have to be smart. You can't think that anything that's green and luscious in the forest is edible and delicious. You have to know what you're looking at, which is why I implore everyone to get uh, experts in the region to show them about wild edibles. In most regions, there is a wild edible group where you can join and, and join in their excursions into your region to learn about more about the plants uh, that will help you survive and thrive and those that will kill you in the area that you live. David, we, uh, we're running out of time. Give us some final words. Please subscribe to David's channels. He is the creator of Adapt 2030 Mini Ice Age Conversations and many other sites. We'll leave you links below. Mr. Dubine, please give us your final words. And we love you. Thanks for the love. Uh, don't spray chemicals all over the yard. Don't spray chemicals all over your property because if you're going to wild forage, you're just going to ingest those chemicals. Please stay chemical free because wild foraging, you're going to be spraying the same stuff you're eating. So go as natural as you can because that's the way you're going to have to move through the future anyway. That's my final thought. Be safe. And I don't mean be safe like be safe because of the mask wearing. I mean... Take caution around your lives if you're going to be working out in nature because things happen fast. Trees fall, sinkholes form. Uh, you know, if you're eating the wrong plant, that's going to onset quick with the toxicity and things. When I say that, I mean 
if you're going to be working around in nature and on the farms in the farmstead and permaculture and horticulture, take caution as you move through the days because, you know, like I say, things are moving fast, changing. And, you know, if it's all new to you, uh, you, you might get hurt, snap a thumb, break a foot, whatever. You know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong out there on the farm. So this is the time when there's a lot of injuries during the planting season. And, you know, harvest season, too, like these two times of the year, hospitals are full in the farm country, planting season and harvest season. Things go wrong fast when there's big, heavy equipment and a lot of things that you're unused to using. And uh, when I say that, yeah, just take caution while you're out there. But enjoy the experience of getting and touching your fingers back into nature again. We love you, Dubine. If you're on the East Coast, stray away from single red and purple berries in the forest and never eat them. I know from experience. Also, stray away from any green, fleshy plants that look extremely nutritious to you because skunk cabbage and other likes have so much oxalic acid they could cause you demise on the east coast as well as the destroying angel which looks like an innocent white mushroom a single touch and a lick, oh. lick to your thumb to your to your tongue would cause death so there is a lot to learn and very little time to gain if in fact the distance of proxima centauri is correct and the slooper flare and the galactic current sheet is coming toward us. That means that we have less than two years to prepare for the, a grid down scenario and the end of the empire. We love you, Dubine. Continue to prepare and share over there. We're going to be, be we're going to be coming down there at some point really soon to meet you and do some podcasts uh, at your orchard. And we'll be talking to you really soon if you can keep it up because a lot of people have been looking for you and the, and they're, I'm sure they're happy to hear that you're safe and alive and thriving in the magnetic reversal and grand solar minimum. We love you, Dubine. Final words, and I'm going to click it off. Bring a handful of mushrooms if you're coming out, and then we can compare species because – Cubensis and the vomiter look very similar in the field when you're driving by. Be careful of both of those. You need to make sure which one is which. But bring the mushrooms, Diamond. Yeah, we will. And that's a boom to knowledge. Where is my logo? There it is. And by the way, make sure if you're planting apples, make sure they're not downwind of the cedars. Look at that apple. That is a schmapple. That's a boom to knowledge. Proper prior planting prevents piss poor performance. When David Dubine is back in America and he's prepping for the inevitable. We love you, David. Be safe. Mm -hmm.